Hello and welcome back to JLXP, episode 87, T1 versus JDG. Thank you once again for watching the quarterfinal breakdowns, for tuning in here for the semifinal breakdowns. They have been a lot of fun to make, and I I want to just keep doing them for, for the rest of the semifinals. This matchup itself was, was very important for a number of reasons. It was the last LPL team alive at the World Championship. It was a chance for T1 to make yet another World Final, for Faker to make his fifth World Finals. The last time he won the World Finals was the last time Worlds was in North America in 2016, and he hadn't been back to Finals since 2017. He had that iconic shot where he's walking off the stage and he's like looking behind himself at the Summoner's Cup with tears in his eyes, and to think that he's persevered through these five years losing in semifinals multiple times, some years not even qualifying for the world championship, and to now be one best of five away from being on top of that mountain once again in his 10th professional year is just something that I think nobody thought possible 10 years ago. So there is so much incredible faker story and incredible faker adoration that he deserves and will be coming his way, I'm sure, throughout the next seven days as everyone prepares for this world championship. And for JDG, there was some really cool stories as well about how they were one of the least popular LPL champions of all time and how winning this series would be so incredibly important for them in gaining some of that regional fandom if they could actually knock off T1 If everyone's clicked on this video, I sure as hell hope you've seen the series. Spoiler alert, they did not. Uh, T1 was able to take this one 3-1 and had some really crazy good outplays. They played so incredibly fast. They they didn't actually have to make many pivots in draft, which is going to make them a little more difficult to prepare for going into the world final because uh, I don't necessarily think they showed a huge amount, and I think they have a lot of flexibility left in the tank. So... Really, overall, this was this was a wildly entertaining series. I, I think T1 looked better in this series than, personally, I thought they have looked all year, and that includes when they went undefeated in the LCK Spring Split, any of their MSI games where they lost in five games to RNG, or any point um, during this world so far. I know they had a little bit of a slump at the end of the summer split, but damn, they did some very impressive things in this series. I want to. I don't have the links for them right now, but during the world's pre-show, there were two segments that really stood out to me as being exceptional. I'll try and I'll try and find timestamps for them in the YouTube vod and like link them in the description here. Uh, Kadrill had this like pre-produced piece that he did voiceover for, in terms of the LCK history and the way that T1 scouted all of the young players that are now with Faker and what their paths were to making it onto the roster at this moment. And then Emily did this really cool uh, like drawing slash voiceover piece where she did all the drawings telling the story of, of 369 and what he's been through and the origins of the name 369, which originally was a meme of you rolling a 3, a 6, or a 9, but he now, you know embrace that and it's been a, a cool part of his brand so uh i don't want to over explain these the segments themselves speak for themselves I, w- I will try and link them in the description um by the time this this video releases but uh that's some really cool stuff from the pre-show and with that i think i actually do want to get into game one of the series so i have the drafts up here throughout the series caitlin was permabanned by edg yumi was permabanned by red side and Aatrox was permabanned by T1. The game one read, I think, from T1 was actually very conservative in terms of draft. So they banned Sejuani, Silas, Aatrox. JDG matches with Caitlyn, Yumi, Graves. I was wondering if they were going to ban the Graves because they want it and excel with it so much for Kanavi. And they might have been daring owner to take it a little bit, but they also pick a somewhat conservative approach. And immediately when the Nami is first picked, that almost locks the entire first phase of the draft uh, at this point in the tournament because Lucian Nami, the best 
answer to it, not necessarily a counterpick, more of something that people are just okay opting into. And we've seen this matchup go both ways throughout the World Championship is Aphelios Lulu. So you pick Nami, you know later you're going to be picking Lucian, you know the other team is going to have to pick Aphelios Lulu. Otherwise, one of the bot lanes is going to be put at a massive disadvantage. So the only question mark in the first phase of the draft is like, does JDG want to power pick a jungler? Or would they rather do Aphelios Lulu right off the bat and then counterpick whatever T1 had done at the time? Because T1 would technically have the options of going mid, jungle, or top lane blind. In this case, JDG with Kanavi having Graves already banned and having Viego as one of the carry jungle options for him, I think just picks him Viego because that's most comfortable. T1 decides to match with Phi to keep it very standard. Like this is as most, as handshaky as the first phase of the draft can be. When you get down into the 4-5 bands, you can see T1 is banning 369. JDG is banning Faker. So JDG banned Victor and Akali. T1 banned Orn and Renekton. And JDG decides to blind pick the Talia. And for me, this is saying they want the champion that is going to be able to impact side lanes the most. There have been a substantial amount of bands dedicated towards the mid lane in this draft. Silas was banned by T1. Victor and Akali banned by JDG. So they felt like Talia was a safe pick in this moment. And then T1 takes a really aggressive answer. So the Galio into the Talia uh, doesn't necessarily guarantee you push. If you can get control of the river, I feel like it does because if Talia ever wants to step up to actually clear the wave, Victor would be in like EW range, especially when Faker takes like Flash Ghost and Phase Rush on Galio. So the gank threat is really high. And they do a Galio Camille, which is definitely saying like they really want to be able to play through top and they want to cut down on the other team's mobility and punish the Aphelios later on in the game. Um, however, I, I think the Orn and Renekton bans, if T1 was to do this again, I think they would probably ban Renekton Jax because Camille would have loved to lane into Orn. I think their team composition still would have worked into Orn, but this team composition certainly does not work very well into Jax. So Jax to me here was the perfect fifth pick by JDG. It's against four melee champions. The only substantial magic damage on the enemy team is Galio, who doesn't want to be using his cooldowns on Jax. So 369 in this game is a little bit inevitable. Looking at the way the game actually played out, you can see even though 369 was only 3, 4, and 9 on Jax, I think he had a really large impact in the game. Um, couple interesting things happened in, in this game in general. There was a lot of back and forth in the early game. JDG got some really good timings to take a dragon early on in the game. Uh, Aphelios got a good blue gun timing. They just pushed Gumayushi and carry it back. Kanavi was there. And the most impactful part of this game, though, I think was around the skirmishes that happened top lane. Camille Jax, especially early, is much more dictated by the mid laners, actually, I think, than the top laners, assuming both top laners are extremely high skill, which they were in this series, Zeus and 369. It was like literally the battle for the top lane title belt with how well they've been performing this year and in this tournament of who is the best top laner in the world. And that's where most of the resources were going. So Faker, would, every time Yagao would leave, Faker could follow. Anytime Faker would leave, would lead with an ultimate. So Zeus could try and combo someone. Yagao wouldn't be that far away because he could just follow with the Weaver's Wall. So tons and tons of top lane stuff. Over time, uh, JDG did get a slight lead here. And 369 started taking over the side lanes a little bit and it also made it very difficult for T1 to approach any team fights because they couldn't do that much damage to Jax. Um, but then I have a few like bolded timestamps here that I thought were, were pretty cool. So uh, there was a moment, 28, 14 seconds, uh, Yagao's Talia actually shows on the top wave and I wrote down that missing like moves into the jungle alone and just gets like picked by, by five T1 players. I had to go back and check this play a few times, but I thought it was crazy what T1 did in in a good way, in a very like unexpected way for missing. Because T1 literally just took like five people, ran them down mid lane, and then hooked into the jungle to kill missing. So at first I'm like, what the hell is missing doing? His mid laner is showing on a top wave. He's too far up. But when I watched it again, no one on T1 actually showed mid. They'd 
walked the area with a sweeper. They had control wards in the river bush. And it was actually like not a designed play because everything is so improvised, but it was incredibly coordinated that because they had the first push on the wave in a spot that it just like naturally, if you're playing League of Legends and you're like more than halfway up in the mid lane, you kind of assume you're on vision. But T1 was absolutely in fog and they just pull the trigger, get that pick. I thought they they did this like a couple of times. So throughout the game, because Jax generally had control of the side waves, because I think their comp was better in team fights, like occasionally Hope would get picked off because hell, it's it's Camille, Galio, Vi. They can kill an Aphelios, right? Um, even after that would happen, JDG was still winning like 4v5s because like no one can kill Jax. It's even hard for them to kill Kanavi. They just build a little bit of armor and still have the Lulu. And then it's really hard for all these melees to dive through a Talia. Like the team composition was very favored for JDG, but I thought T1 was just getting getting all these picks and making these like smart decisions throughout the game. One of the smart de- decisions in this game, even though JDG was st- stacking Drakes, T1, instead of fighting over Cloud Drake or Cloud Soul, which they would probably lose that fight for, just zips towards the Baron. They burst it down as JDG is getting Cloud Soul. Um, and I think generally worth the trade. And then they almost win the game with another wicked good mid play. Like Faker is just, it's, it's again in the mid lane. It's again when Hope is trying to clear the wave, but Faker just is not on vision, has a really good angle to like flash ghost in with his Galio, get a pick onto Hope, push down, get, you know, a bunch of deep mid push as the elder dragon is about to come up at 37 minutes. And I think the elder fight in this game was really the deciding factor. Uh, by this time, JDG not only had the cloud soul to dance around and make the fight pretty difficult, but they also had three GAs completed three, six, nine Kanavi and hope all had GA. So Kanavi and 369 both sacrificed their GA while Hope is slowly running back to this fight since he was the one who got picked off. Uh, They get there just in time. They push T1 off. They get a couple kills. That also means that they respawn first. Uh, They get the Elder Dragon. They move over. They get Baron. They get it, or they don't get Baron. They get a couple picks and they kind of end the game. So, really interesting game one. I thought actually T1 probably outplayed JDG. But JDG had a better team comp. And I I use the word outplay very lightly because ultimately the team that won is the team that outplayed because they won with the tools that were available to them. Um, I thought Jax was pretty untouchable in this game, especially once JDG had a few top plays that went their way. As I mentioned before, the four melee champions and largely physical damage team into Jax who can build a frozen heart and have Lulu shields is going to make it a really hard game for T1 to play. But T1 still found multiple plays in the Fog of War that nearly won them the game. But I think the draft diff in this one was just too big and T1 didn't snowball the early game. I think for T1 to win this game, uh, they would have had to win the plays around topside. If Zeus gets far enough ahead, he can keep enough pressure on Jax in the early game. Uh, They can threaten more kills in the side lane on Jax. They could then, once they have killed Hope, the rest of JDG wouldn't actually be there to turn the fight. And I think T1 might've been able to get some momentum, but it just didn't happen. So grades for this game, which I'm going to post in the description and are also the source of most controversy, but I'm going to continue doing it because I know the people that, that listen to this podcast can at least understand the context behind the grading for the people that copy paste the grades elsewhere. Just they're going to debate about it no matter what. Apparently there was a lot of that happening on some Korean forums for the last uh, last set of these videos. But game one grades, T1, I gave a B to Zeus, a, a B minus to owner. Even though they lost the 2v2s, they were very close, and I thought they played out this game quite well. I actually gave a an A to Faker for all of the plays he, he was making in this game. And weirdly enough, like an A plus to Gumiyushi. And I want to explain this a little bit because they were, like, they did actually, they did actually lose this game. But... He was navigating some of these fights so well, had a large CS lead at certain points in this game, had item break points on Hope, was the reason that they could burst down the Baron so quickly, was the reason that it was difficult in some ways for JDG to set up in mid lane. Him and Carrie played a really strong game. Um, but for JDG, I gave an S to both 369 and Kanavi. And uh, A, B plus, B plus 
to round that out. Caria got an A plus as well. Okay, switching gears to game two as we speak. Okay, game two. T1 switches. They only, they only switch one ban. They stay. They actually stay on blue side. So JDG opts to run this one back on red side again. Thinks they can make a tweak. Interesting strategy. Let's see if it works out for him. So with the Viego banned, the Silas is left open. That was what was banned in game one. And JDG takes us right away. At the start of the day, the desk mentioned how the mid lane meta had actually become heavily about Silas Akali. The four remaining mid laners had all had like at least six games on Silas Akali combined. And they'd been they'd been running, kind of running the server. So when you lock in Silas, maybe you think Faker's going to play Akali, even though it's a little bit disadvantaged. Um, but no, Faker has something else up his sleeve. He takes the rise. And there's only been one other rise at the World Championship. That was in the quarterfinals. <laughs> he just locks it in. I'm, I'm trying to find, uh, yeah, here are the stats. So in 2022, rise versus Silas, 45 games. It's a 62% Silas win rate, and Silas is down about 8.6 CS at 15. In this game, Faker was up 24. So 16 above the average. Also, Gumiyushi was up 19 CS at 15 in the same Lucian, Nami, Ophelios, Lulu handshake. Um, but I'll finish the draft talk first. This was the reappearance of the Yone for Zeus, and it was also the appearance of the Belveth. Belveth for... Uh, <laughs> Belvath for Kanavi. Funny story. I was actually saying Belvath a, a lot during one of the casts, and I got some feedback like, "No, it's it's Belvath." But yeah, I need to pay attention to those new champions' pronunciations. Belvath. Uh, it's it's Belvath. I'm pretty sure. So um, apologies if the wrong pronunciation comes out during this, but it just made me laugh when I was thinking about saying this again. So uh, the, the the overall strategy for these team comps. I don't think this is a terrible Malphite angle. Kadra broke it down in the post game as well. Like the Malphite itself into, uh, you know, Yone is not going to lose the lane terribly. It is going to give up pressure, but Lucian, pretty short range. So you can theoretically land Malphite alts onto him if you just wait for him to dash. Rise, also pretty short range. So you should be able to find some pretty good angles. The difficulty here came in for JDG with the ability to follow up on the Malphite engages which wasn't always there. It was hard for them to walk through Nami. It was really hard for them to walk through Poppy. So a lot of times you'd see the Malphite go in. Maybe he'd find a good alt, but like the Aphelios couldn't really close the gap. Silas in this game was out pressured heavily by Faker's Rise. So he was never really there at the right times in the fights. And Belveth was just kind of like too squishy to make it in. Poppy was doing a really good job of zoning him out. So like not a, not a terrible Malphite angle at the time. It looks good for Malphite, but as the game played out, it was very difficult to actually affect the game in a big way. So I'm going to go a little bit forward in this game because I think that's when the interesting stuff ended up happening. The first time stamp I have here was actually all the way um, at 22 minutes and 54 seconds. So very very mechanically intensive series. I just don't want this to be too recappy and I wanted to talk about what I feel to be like the most important moments. So at 22.54, the game is very even. Faker is bot side and four JDG players are recalling. They're, they're midway through their recall. And as Faker finishes clearing the wave, a bunch of people on T1 just start pinging the Baron. And they then, Faker doesn't recall. He teleports to bot wave at the same time that Zeus's Yone teleports to the same spot. They then realm warp from that spot into the Baron pit. Now, like seven seconds ago, the Yone and Rise were bot lane. So JDG thinks they have a bunch of time to reset and then go out and take control. But T1 makes like, such, like this is such a good play because they're, they're able to they're able to sneak Baron off of this play. But the reason it worked is it's just it's so unexpected to go for it that fast. And like JDG when they saw Faker on that bot wave, there's no 
alarm in their head that says, oh yeah, by the way, Baron could be dead in the next 15 to 20 seconds, but it actually is. So like this was, this was to me the big brain play of this, of this game too, which I realize now I want to throw up the scoreboard for those people that are, that are watching this, even though they, they see the draft. So yeah, like Fager was zero three six, but like he, I think he's the one that saw this play to to go for the Baron, and they get the Baron. It lets them get to their power spikes, and then with the Baron, they just keep the game like so incredibly chaotic. So even though JDG is is setting up for dragons, which they got three of this game, T one is constantly like making these pickoffs throughout the rest of the map. Like with their Baron buff, they end up opening. Uh, top inhibitor, but then also like Caria randomly snuck up there to turn a 2v2, and it just felt like JDG could never really feel comfortable with where they were on the map because T1 was moving so well in this game. And the other thing that I thought really got hammered home this game, even though Gumiyushi Caria didn't dominate Hope missing in laning phase, they completely dominated them in the mid game. There were at least two instances where Hope would try and step up to a wave and the lightning quick ability for Gumiyushi and Karia on Lushinami to just kill the Aphelios from seemingly any angle. Because you just you just Gale Force, dash, have the Nami speed, get the E-slow. There's too much damage for Hope to deal with. And like... This is another thing to point out about like Lucian Nami. It's not just an early game pick. If you're against a team comp like this that has like only one champion that quote outranges you in the in the Aphelios, like you can see in so many instances, once this Lucian gets like four items, he just dashes in, uses a combo on a support, and he can take like 80% of their health by the late game. And it's such a safe play if you pick the right angles. So uh Gumiyushi I think kind of proves that Lucian is not just an early game pick in some of the ways he was playing it in this game. And with that like crazy Baron control and crazy map play, it it eventually kind of gets to this point where like there was one really critical fight where the Lucian dashes in to nearly kill Hope again and 369 alts forward because he like literally needs to protect his team, but doesn't work. Gumiyushi has too much mobility, is able to dodge away. Malphite gets isolated, killed. T1 takes more control. Also, as they're getting more stopwatches, the Malphite becomes less and less impactful. So 369 landed some really good ultimates early in the game. But then like once Faker has stopwatch, you can easily at this level, reaction time, the Malphite ultimate with stopwatch, which makes Malphite the saddest person. Gumiyushi was always positioned so incredibly well, was dashing away perfectly. And then once Zeus's Yone got some items, he was... He was incredibly cracked in this game as well with some of his patience and like mechanics under turrets. I don't have exactly the notes written down for for what happened, but like the the mechanical level that T1 was playing to was absolutely absurd this series. They played so well. So yeah, anyway, game two, T1, they controlled side lanes like crazy. Zeus and Faker had a ton of individual outplays. Gumiyushi, I think, showed why the Lushinami Pryo can be and was so high this series. They really ran the map with that combo. And just, they didn't give JDG easy setup to any teamfights, which is what they ultimately wanted with the Malphite Aphelios Lulu. Like, the Aphelios Lulu wants the game to be more structured, and the Lushinami wants the game to be more open, because whenever you get the Aphelios Lulu in open space, the Lushinami can shine. If you're in a front-to-back teamfight that's when you're going to feel the range advantage. But if you're in the open, you don't feel it. So a nut, like really solid game by T1. <clears throat> All right, let's go to game three. Swap sides. So JDG finally decide to try their hand. And this is where I think the series goes bad for JDG. They don't deny Lushinami. So they take blue side. And they literally do the same handshake. They just take Viego first and say, okay, T1, you can pick whatever bot lane handshake you want. Of course they're going to take Nami Lucian again. You're really going to answer with Aphelios Lulu? Really? Like they banned the Yone because it, they they didn't have a good answer for it. They didn't like the way the Malphite played. Yone got too fed. 
But they also didn't have the confidence to be able to execute the Lucian Nami and beat Gumiyushi's Aphelios, which I think which I think speaks for itself. And then Faker, the absolute madman, just blind picks Rise. It's not even <laughs> It's not even a Silas counterpick. It's not even a priority pick. There's not even mid lane bans. Silas is open, Akali's open, Azir's open, Victor's open. Nah. Nah, man. Faker 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 will take Rise. <laughs> like what do you what are you really gonna do? What are you really gonna do against that? Um, ideally like lots of things um, but I think the moment and the near absence of rise from the meta made JDG very unprepared for, for what was coming the rest of this draft Talia Galil ban Lee Sin Jay's ban some targets on both sides obviously T1 banning out mid laners to protect the rise a little bit basically the Talia Galil ban say the Rise is going to be the number one roaming mid laner. No matter what you take, Talia and Galio would be the two mid laners that could match it. So that's where I really like this pick, actually. And then Lee Sin Jay Sergis bans one targeted at Owner, one targeted at Zeus. And then they just take Nocturne because they clearly want to open up this map as much as possible. They didn't ban the Renekton like they did in previous games. And 369 gets it. Uh, Azir is picked up for Yagao. Which traditionally Rise is good into Azir, but with current power level of Rise, I'm not sure if it's supposed to be. Haven't seen the matchup enough. This game would make you think that Rise is super good. Um, and then five pick gangplank. So that's going to be immediately when you see the GP locked in early, you're thinking, all right, there's going to be a ton of attention topside. Uh, even though the Nami Lucian want to play a high volatility lane, so much of this game should make or break around top lane. Um, and really, like, the the first dive by JDG in this game was so good. They stacked a very big wave. They moved towards the turret. And even though Zeus had kept his health quite safe, the wave was so big that JDG was able to do two dives. So they dive the first time, get a lot of damage down, and then back off. They wait the required three seconds for the turret to reset. And what I mean by that is that every turret shot does successively more damage up to like three hits when it's max damage. But if no one is taking turret aggro for three seconds, when you re-engage it, that turret shot is back to the low damage. But if you re-engage a second later, it's going to be a hot turret that hits you for a bunch of damage. So JDG does this perfectly. They know they can't full burst the gangplank with their first dive. They get him really low. They back off. They let the turret reset. They go in again. They get a kill. <clears throat> funnily enough though because he has futures market dude still buys sheen so Zeus can still get sheen even though he only had 11 cs and gets turret dove killed um but they just like they keep going back up there <clears throat> they get another 2v2 win um as owner tried to save it on nocturne but kanabi is there for a viego counter gank renekton is fed he's freezing the wave like th the game is looking good but I, ha I have to go through these parts because they're so pivotal. Like, if this is a structured, slow game and Renekton is in that game state, it feels <clears throat> really good. <clears throat> like, really good for JDG because Renekton is going to hit six first. They're going to be able to have Rift Herald control. Ophelios Lulu can theoretically play stable. Azir should be able to play stable. Um, but, like, this game in total was probably the closest I've seen to, like, an elite, super high-level scrim than any other world semifinal I've probably ever seen. It was, it was so, so fast paced. Um, yeah. What is the, I'm trying to check what the total kill death count in this one is, if I can see it on this graphic. Yeah. 18 kills for JDG and 23 kills by T1 in a 30 minute, 54 second game. So very, very high kills. Um, the other big top lane thing that happened, I think Kanabi griefed it a little bit, but if he would have pulled this play off, he would have possibly like ended Zeus's game. There was a really big wave crashing after another skirmish had left 369 dead, and Kanabi had just hit six. So he's thinking that if he can just dive Zeus under the turret, doesn't even really matter if he trades his life for it. He's going to deny this big wave. Renekton would have basically like this two level advantage on him. But he misses the alt. Zeus dodges the alt, uh, the Viego alt. But either way, Zeus gets the kill and a shutdown bounty onto Kanavi and collects the wave. So that 
that puts the gangplank like at least into a serviceable state in the game. Throughout the game, like 369's Renekton still solo killed Zeus' gangplank twice and Faker's Rise once. So he was still a really big boy on Renekton. He was still a massively important factor in this game. But I would say the overall, again, chaos that T1 can create on the map, but then they still play within this chaos in seemingly such an organized fashion, it was just way too much for JDG to, to, to keep up with. And the best example of this game was about six minutes in. This is where Faker got his first two kills. So it's a play that you basically have to make without comms. The top lane fight that I just talked about that eventually ended with Kanavi dying to Zeus is happening. Like it's this big 2v2 fight, game deciding level fight in the top lane. Meanwhile, because both junglers are showing top lane, the bot lanes decide to all in as well which is pretty common for bot lanes. When you see everyone on the map, you think, all right, time to throw down. Let's do it. So like, imagine you're in, you're in comms and there's a top 2v2 going and a bot 2v2 going. How chaotic that is. Support's communicating with AD. Top is communicating with jungle. They're both talking at the same time. Within this, Faker pushes mid, fades towards bottom lane, and Rise alts in for this kill. Like, in isolation, Rise pushing mid and moving bot lane for a kill is, like, not a massive outplay. But for some reason, I just thought this was so good because of how chaotic the game was, because of how much the game hinged on what happened in the top play, for Faker to actually just, like, ignore it, push the wave in a turret. Yagao is obviously just catching because too much chaos is going on. And then he gets the double kill bottom lane, which also burns hope and missing summoner spells. It allows them to repeat gank bottom lane when Nocturne is level six. It really speeds them up in the game. Um, I thought that that sequence at six minutes is what, what really did like win them the game in game three. That was to me the most decisive moment. 19 minutes into this game as well, the mid control of Lucian Nami is probably bigger in this game than it even was in the previous game. Like, Hope and Missing just can't step up to the wave. Uh, And I realize now looking at these notes, I might have misstated something that happened in game two when 369 throws his body in front of uh, Lucian Nami in mid lane as Malphite. I, I think I confused that in my head with this game, so sorry about that. But that's what happened here at 19 minutes. Like, Gumiyushi Carrier are trying to kill... Aphelios with Lucian Nami and 369 just has to step up because otherwise his AD carry is going to die. But they just dash backwards. 369 gets killed. They actually win a big fight off of this. T1 gets Baron. Um, and this is this is likely the game over, right? Like T1 is playing exceptionally well around mid lane. Faker's roaming to side lanes. 369 is a monster, but they're holding on to it. But I have to shout out one thing about JDG this game um, and do a quick little side tangent on Nocturne. One of the underrated things about watching Nocturne in Spectator View is you don't really understand how little these guys can see. Like, that's one of the reasons Nocturne was a big pick against Kog'Maw back in the day is because when Kog'Maw had his W on, the Nocturne alt, like, effectively reduced his range because Kog with W was greater range than what you can actually attack with a Nocturne alt. But watching these fights, it almost felt like JDG wasn't nearsighted at all. Like, Yagao was still actually dashing forward into what effectively should be blind because he, because he even had a, he either had a memory of where T1 would be or he could just kind of tell where they would be based on the conditions of the fight. I thought JDG made some of these fights incredibly close, which I think a lesser team would have just fallen over even faster versus the map pressure that, that T1 was was putting out but yeah overall the recap for this game is like it looked the closest to an elite scrim that i've ever seen during a world semi-final the skill checks top lane but specifically when kanavi tried to dive zeus's gangplank was absolutely huge but faker ran the map here like he was 5-0 at one point up in cs on his ear and I really do think if this was a more controlled game, if T1 wasn't able to push the side waves and mid, mid lane pressure with Lucian Nami so aggressively, I think the Renekton might have been able to solely take over the game. But 
it got too fast and T1 was too good at playing together with too many globals. Um, so across the board, I gave them S plus for Faker and SS for Gumiyushi and Karia. Uh, Zeus gets a B. He clutched up at the end of the game, but I don't think without the performance of the rest of his team, he would have had the opportunity to do so, which is why he doesn't have a higher grade because his late game team fighting was still awesome. Like it was still amazing. I just, I have to balance it out with the way with the way the rest of those grades go. JDG, this is where their bot lane really started disappointing me though. I gave a C to Hope, a C plus to Missing, Bs to Kanabi and Yagao. Might want to drop the Yagao one actually, but the reason it's a B is because his team fighting was still so good and he made a lot of big plays, even if Faker was completely schooling him on the map. Still a pretty big gap between S plus and B, so I think I'm okay with it. Um, and I gave an S to 369, three solo kills. He tried to put the team on his back. It just... It just wasn't enough. And I, I don't I don't hold Kanavi diving Zeus and giving him a 450 gold bounty against him. So 369 did his best. Game four. Everyone. It, there's not much to say about game four. I think JDG kind of lost their minds. They banned the Lucian. About time. If they weren't, Willing to first pick it away. I thought that should have been done in game two. But then, I don't know what this Karma Jin was. I really don't know what this Karma Jin was. This is not a combo, as far as I know. A lot of times you'll put Jin with like a an engage roaming support because you just have crazy engage and it allows like a high damage, low utility rest of the map to work. Like you pack your utility in the bottom lane. So you can do damage everywhere else. But like they throw a Sejuani top lane. Maybe they think Belveth can hard carry the game. I don't know. It just it it looked like a like they're literally just kind of throwing stuff at the wall because they had no way of drafting around Karyagumi Yushi. If anyone has had a lot of success with Jin Karma, uh please please tell me in the comments. I would love to learn. But it just didn't seem like it was gonna be the thing that pulls JDG out of this. Right after this draft, I thought the series was over. Um, partially just because of how crazy and outplayed JDG probably felt in game three. Maybe even if they have a better draft, uh, the game the game can be good. The Varus Renata in this draft from T1 and the way they just got kills early and then never stopped getting kills was, was awesome. I mean, this was... Check this out. 30 kills to 7 in 24 minutes and 54 seconds. This was just the icing on the cake for T1. Like this game was essentially a victory lap after what was an incredibly tough series. There was a moment in the Rift Herald fight of this game where Faker swoops in on Azir, actually misses his ultimate back on Hope. So Faker is standing right next to Hope's Jin and Missing's Karma. And he just stands there. He's just there for like 10 seconds. And at the time, I think Hope had Swifty Boots, like two long swords and a pickaxe. It was just, it was the most, it was the saddest, most pathetic looking thing. Like Jin had no power in this game. Um, so yeah, I just feel like the angle was wrong. Uh, Gumiushi Karia, not only did they get first blood, they got like 2v2 kill later. Uh, Zeus played tank versus tank. Like, hell yeah, man. He can carry on the... The Yone, and he can also have a badass game on, on Gragas. Owner, I thought, had an incredibly solid series. Maybe I'm doing him a little dirty uh, here because I didn't feel like... Like, I felt so many of the big plays this series were like Karia or Faker or Gumiyushi just having insane team fights. But Owner obviously has to be there. Like, it, I'll, I'll put the grades in, in the description. I gave really good grades for everyone on T1 in this game. A+, plus, A+, plus, S, S, S+. Plus. Karia was player of the game. And the, the desk agreed, and I gave pretty much all season Bs to JDG because they looked pretty tilted in this one. I would say I would say overall for this series, T1, as I said in the start, looked better than they have all tournament. I think it gives them a lot of momentum going into the finals. I think there is a level of significance here for the LCK in general that is going to feel like in some ways, like T1 has already been a big part of this. The, the last, what, what happened here is in quarterfinals, the only team to beat a Korean team was another Korean team. 
Now T1 is in finals and there's two Korean teams playing against each other in the other semifinal. So what is going to happen is LCK teams will be the only teams to knock out LCK teams, which hasn't happened since 2017. And that was when there were three LCK teams at Worlds. This year, there are four. Um, It's a level of regional dominance they haven't experienced since 2017. And arguably, this is even more so. So that is, this is the year of the LCK. And there's a small bit I want to do on this where, and sorry if I'm a broken record saying this for the people who watch all the time, but in the olden days, Korea was very much about like, why are you taking this fight? You have to be fighting over something. Every fight was for a purpose and that purpose was going to be an objective and they played with so much discipline. They would punish you if you were out of place, but like the mindset of so much of the region was like maximize your CS, maximize your gold, your team comp is going to make sense. You're going to win team fights. Then I think like the mechanics and the giant server population of LPL and the like actually know getting 300 gold is the objective. That's why I'm trying to fight. Kind of kind of overpowered the LCK a little bit. That was like rookie and the shy for IG being the two most dominant solo laners in a meta that was defined by solo lane dominance. They won the world championship in 2018. But then like this new era, this new era of T1, and I think this transfers to some of the players on the other LCK teams, like Zeka, this incredibly young, highly mechanical mid laner for DRX. It's it's so fast. They are playing faster than the LPL teams are playing. And in T1's case, the reason it's so cool and dangerous is they still have that connection to the past with Faker. So he's still able to make these great macro reads, but the team is also willing to play so quickly, which makes them like devastatingly good. And... It makes me really excited for the finals. So I'm sure I'll think of something else. Uh, I'll be doing another episode here tomorrow for Genji vs. DRX. So if I think of something huge or if I miss something, let me know in the comments. I'll mention it in, in the next episode right off the top. And yeah, T1-3-1. Faker's going back to finals again. Let's see if he can win his fifth title. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.